Hi, I'm Greg Dell here with Attorney Cesar Gavidia, and today we have the opportunity to discuss one of your resolved cases against um, New York Life Disability Insurance yeah. Company, and I understand this was a lawsuit case that you had. So in these types of videos, I like people to get an understanding of what the situation was for the claimant, meaning why, how were they denied and why, and what were we able to do for the claimant, and then hopefully share some tips for people so that they can learn from this denial to help them with their case. So sure. first give us the background of this case. So. Um, you mentioned it was New York Life. Originally, it was actually Cigna, and then New York Life acquired Cigna. Um, our client was a software engineer, a very high-level uh, occupation. Requires, it, you know, it's one of those occupations that, you know, one doesn't think requires a lot of physical um, functionality, but it it does. I mean, you 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 sit for very long periods of time working on on a computer. I mean, people think sedentary is just sedentary doing nothing but when you t deal with the type of problems medical problems that our client had um, you know you're gonna have some serious phys physical functional so what, what were the uh, medical issues for this particular client? so um, she was struggling with really severe lower back pain radiculopathy and in many cases you know this these type of problems arise from what uh, are described as like bulging discs or um, uh, arthritis in the spine, narrowing of the, of the, of the spinal canal, or, or things like that. Those are pretty common situations that induce or cause lower mm -hmm. back pain and the type of symptoms she was having. In her case, she was dealing with these abnormal kind of rare um, cysts called Tarlov cysts, okay? And basically, these cysts would appear at the lower uh, end of her spine, in her lumbar spine, and they would compress on the spinal cord, okay? And they're filled with fluid, and they would grow kind of around the spinal cord. She had a few of these. In addition to that, she had a uh, condition known as Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which is a connective tissue disorder. Now, Tarlov cysts appear very commonly with, this, with Ehlers-Danlos. So aside from just the lower back pain and the radiculopathy and the problems and, and you know, kind of jolts of electricity she was having down her legs, she was also dealing with and struggling with widespread musculoskeletal body pain. Throughout her so, body? Throughout her body. So she was really having a hard time focusing, concentrating. Um, the pain aside, she couldn't even get through a lot of the programming and development that she was required to be doing as a software engineer for this company that she was working for. And she for. was with a very, one of the big, large companies, big, but, but due to confidentiality, we can't say who it was. That's right, that's mm -hmm. right. But when they get hired into these companies, they're developing software and, and creating programs that are specific to the needs of that company, okay? So, you know, you have to have really kind of a creative process. You have to have an analytical process. You really have to have high-level executive functionality. And she was struggling significantly with that um, because of all the pain and, and problems so, she was having. So she was having cognitive difficulties? She was, yeah. As well as pain symptoms? As well as pain symptoms. Right. So listening to what, you, what you're saying, how did New York Life deny her? Like, so uh, in around two, in 2019, um, she, even though she tried to push through it and she struggled through a lot of these problems for a while, um, she just couldn't do it anymore. And she took medical leave, she filed a short-term disability claim, and uh, upon reviewing the short-term disability claim, um, New York Life denied it, or Cigna at the time denied it. Um, denied short-term? She denied short-term. Wow, right out of the box. Right out of the box. Um, she uh, appealed that and they denied that. She also applied for long-term, which is something I recommend mm -hmm. because often this process takes some months, okay? Some people get paid short-term and then get denied right before it's gonna end. And that's kind of a strategic thing because the, the carrier doesn't wanna even get into the long-term already. Right. So they kind of preempt it. They say, okay, your recovery should be done. You're ready to go back. We're not even gonna look at long-term. In this case, they denied her the short-term they, uh, she applied to, for long-term as we had recommended and she got denied long-term. So we were appealing the short-term and we were appealing the long-term and uh, you know, what they basically done at that point in New York Life was they, they referred the case out to a peer review doctor. And these peer review doctors, as you know, what they do is a paper review of the file. Mm -hmm. They never once had her physically <coughs> examined, which is, is kind of that 
I think one of those um, ideal cases where they could have had her examined and likely would have found that she is struggling with some pretty f significant physical limitations and, and problems. But they didn't do that. They just did a paper review of the file. Um, and, uh, however, um, what we did on the appeal was we, we did have her physically examined. We did functional capacity testing. We basically laid out all the objective uh, findings that showed that she had really significant limitations, particularly with sitting, particularly with having to maintain focus and um, you know, manage and work through a lot of this high level, um, high level duties and tasks that she has as a software engineer. Um, but basically, their peer reviewer didn't even touch on any of that. They didn't even look at a lot of the objective findings with the uh, diagnostic studies for the, that showed these cysts growing around her spine. Um, her doctors, by the way, were extremely supportive. You know, many of these doctors, and we find these, these, these problems all the time in cases, they don't want to get involved with disability insurance. Right. They don't want to have to, you know, fill out paperwork. They're intimidated by the insurance company. They often say the wrong things to the, to the uh, insurance company doctors and, and jeopardize the claims. Um, in her case, her doctors were great. She had an interventional radiologist that was... Uh, uh, putting, uh, really putting together kind of the full picture of what was going on with the Tarlov cysts in her spine. She had a connective uh, tissue disorder doctor that was treating her. She had in, a board certified internal medicine doctor who was supporting the disability claim. And I could not have, I, I could tell you, there are a few cases where I saw such emphatic support from a claimant's treating doctors. And that I think was part of what was really pushing, you know, our case um, and and, uh, and why, we, why she had such a strong case going into litigation after they denied her appeal. Because she did have that unwavering support. And we got a lot of that, that evidence into the record. But on appeal, is all they did was one internal, uh, internal or external doctor review? That's right. All they did was an internal doctor review, peer review of the file. Um, and I think they knew that they, you know, once they got the, their hands on this, the defense, uh, the defense attorneys, um, probably saw that, you know, there's a lot of support coming from, um, from her doctors and from her side and a lot of objective findings with, with regards to the physical limitations. Um, it wasn't all subjective. Now we had objective findings and they knew that there was, uh, there was a problem there in terms of their defense. Were you surprised by the denial at the appeal level? I actually, you know, it's, uh, doing this as long as we, we've been doing it, it's hard to get surprised anymore, but in her case, just because of how supportive her doctors were, how I knew that we really had put forth the best possible appeal in case that we could, I was surprised by the fact that they denied it at, that, at the LTD level. But I think it was also an administrative problem for them because that upon you know, denying the LTD, I felt that now they would have to go also overturn their short-term decision. You know? So it was a very long period of benefits here that they were looking at. So when you, after the appeal was denied, the only other remedy remaining was to file a lawsuit, correct? correct. And is that what you did? That's what we did, yeah. Did you do it on long-term and short-term? We did it on both, right. So I brought, we brought a cause of action under ERISA to recover both her short-term benefits that were owed, which is the ba basically the full 26-week period, mm -hmm. and um, all the benefits starting with her long-term claim, which started at 181 days going forward. And did you think you had a strong lawsuit when you filed it? You know, I f with these cases, we abs you know, we, we did feel, I did feel that we had a really strong case going forward because of the support and the appeal that we put forth. Um, the issue with ERISA, and in this particular case, I thought we were going to have a hard time getting around an abuse of discretion standard or re a review. In other words, arguing to the court that either the discretionary, the discretionary language in the policy was invalid um, or that they didn't properly give themselves discretion in the case or that they shouldn't have discretion to... Mm -hmm. um, to uh, apply that standard of review at the litigation level. Um, but outside of that, I saw very few issues uh, in terms of the merits of the case itself. But even with the arbitrary and capricious review, which means the judge ultimately has to decide, first of all, do I think that New York Life got the decision wrong? If the judge says, yeah, I think they got it wrong, then he goes to step two. Correct. And step two is, did they act reasonable in their review? So the ultimate issue, it sounds like, in this lawsuit was them going to one doctor versus all of the other evidence that's been submitted in which your client had multiple treating doctors, multiple MRIs, multiple x-rays, multiple therapy, <laughs> I mean, tons of occupational evidence. 
was the judge going to find that New York Life just relying on one doctor was enough to say that, yes, they acted reasonably? Right. Um, so what were your options at that point during the, you know, during the lawsuit in terms of do you have to go forward to a, to a verdict with a judge or is there settlement opportunities that come so up? So in this case, um, we participated in mediation, which is a form of alternative dispute resolution. In most federal courts across the country, they require this. Um, in, in, in the Southern District of Florida, they do require it as part of the litigation process. The court um, basically wants the parties to come together and try to resolve the case before they have to make this, the decision. And if they make the decision, someone's gonna walk away unhappy. They can't, you know, they usually don't find a way to make both parties happy with, with the court's decision. And um, we participated in mediation. It's a confidential process, so nothing that's done at mediation can be revealed except that it can be said that the case was resolved, mm -hmm. okay? The court was notified that the case was resolved and, you know, stipulations being that now there's also a dismissal, dismissal of the action, right? Um, but the good thing in terms of mediation um, in, in that process is that it gives the claimant options, you know, and then they're not options that they usually have at the onset of their case or their claim or, or at, you know, at the end of the appeal process. It usually ha does require getting into the litigation phase of a case uh, before you have that option. Right. But what's good about mediation also is that when you bring in a mediator, particularly a mediator who's knowledgeable, who understands, in, in our case, the Employer Retirement Income Security Act, right. the ERISA, and understands kind of the, the complexities of that law and the impact of that law on disability claims, um, it could lead to a very, you know, re, a, you know, in most cases it leads to a, a favorable result. Right. And, and I tell clients and, you know, when you get in that situation, you have the opportunity to go to a mediation, it becomes a business decision because, you know, whatever the value is, if, if the policy is worth, you know, these cases usually resolve in a lump sum settlement, which means that the carrier offers you one sum of money, you either take it or you don't. And if you do take it, then you're done. The policy's over. You never get anything else from them, but you have no obligations to them. You go do whatever you want. But I tell people, you know, if your policy is worth 500000 and someone offers you 200,000. You got to think about is this the that's a guaranteed 200,000 for you. There's no guarantees ever. We can never guarantee anyone's going to win under no set of, set of circumstances. However, do you want to invest now 200,000 into this particular case to get 500,000? Right. Cuz we know the upside. This is not a personal injury auto accident world where we're going to go ask the jury for 10 million dollars and hope that they ask them for anything. We don't have that option in these right. cases. In these cases, these are breach of contract, breach of fiduciary duty, where we're saying, look, you owe me X amount of dollars. And really, when you go to trial, the only thing they owe you is the back benefits they haven't paid you. Right. Because you could win this case, Caesar, and if this particular client was owed three years of benefits, then New York Life has to pay them three years of benefits. But the next day, they can cut, cut off the client and go, sorry, yeah, That's we right. owe you those three years. So there's a lot of... And the other thing I want to mention, because you just reminded me, that if the case, if, if the claimant is denied or cut off before even the own occupation uh, period of disability, and most of these group policies is two years, is over, then the court could just decide basically what they're owed, as you said, up to the time period right. that they stop benefits. Usually it's the entire ONOC period, but they can't make a decision in, in terms of whether they're they're disabled from any gainful occupation. In most cases, they remand it back yes, to the insurance company. Always. And then, you know, they could get denied at that stage and as well. And when you even bring that up, in, in your particular case, where the claimant had never been paid, a lot of judges, you'll go through this whole um, summary judgment motion or bench trial with the judge, and the judge will go, yes, I think they were wrong. I'm remanding the case back to the company to make a determination in light of what I found. Right. But it could just be that they're remanding it back and the judge goes, I don't think it was fair that you used one doctor. I want you to go have them IME now or, or something right. like that. The judge, in most cases where a claimant's never been paid, does remand. As opposed to if the claimant had been paid, usually the judge will say, I'm finding that you're disabled and I'm awarding benefits. So that's another, there's a lot of risk in this wow. particular situation. And we tell clients exactly how it is. We don't sugarcoat it. We want to get them as much money as possible because we work on a contingency fee as well. So we're going to get paid. The more they get paid, the more we're going to get paid. So we have all the incentive in the world to try to get max dollars on these cases. But it's not our money. It's the client's money. So, right. you know, if 
the number is never going to be what the client particularly is expecting or wants. But if the number is there, you got to always have this business decision, which we guide the clients to. So in your case, obviously, client made the final decision and said, you know what? I want to minimize my risk. I want a certainty. I'm happy to settle. And you, you got a resolution. So that was a great outcome. You know, anyone out there who has a New York life case, feel free to call Caesar or myself. No matter where you live in the country, we're available to assist you. And we look forward to the opportunity to provide you with a free consultation.